Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit Arts and Culture. Ken Quattro and his new book on the untold stories of black comic book artists called Invisible Men, how they face systemic racism and open doors for the future generations. Plus, Detroit's queen of the blues, Thornetta Davis, on her collaboration with actor Jeff Daniels that went viral. Then, the work of artist Sabrina Nelson and the Detroit Youth Choir with a performance at Mary Grove. It's all coming up on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation and viewers like you. Hi there, I'm Christy McDonald, and welcome to One Detroit Arts and Culture. Thanks so much for joining me. We started this show during the early days of the pandemic last year as a way to connect people with musicians, artists, and cultural events that they loved and were really missing. It's a way for us to get our arts and culture fix until we can all gather together again. So coming up on the show, One Detroit's Will Glover catches up with Michigan author Ken Quattro. He's known as the comics detective, and he has a new book out called Invisible Men, the trailblazing black artists of comics books. Ken shares how he found out about these untold stories of black comic book artists from the 30s to the 1950s and how they're influencing comics today. Plus, you will meet artist Sabrina Nelson and see her exhibition on the power of black motherhood, loss, and transformation. And then you can't help but be inspired and entertained by the Detroit Youth Choir. They'll perform for us at Mary Grove. It is all just ahead. But we're starting off with Detroit's own Queen of the Blues. Thornetta Davis has been making music here in Detroit for over 30 years. And like a lot of artists, COVID brought her live performances and promotions to a halt. But her recent collaboration with actor Jeff Daniels went viral. And she tells me how the song, I Am America, stretched her creatively in new ways. Well, my baby up and left me, did me a favor when he did. Shoo, shoo, shoo. What has this last year been like for you as as a musician? Wow. Um, well, it's, it's definitely been a, uh, a crazy experience because I haven't been able to get out and perform. There were so many things we were going to do this past year. Me and my band, we we're going to do a lot of traveling. Um, I think the week of the uh, cancellation of everything all over the country, we were going to uh, Austin, Texas, and we were, we were going to perform down there a number of gigs for the South by Southwest convention. And they canceled that immediately. You've worked with everyone from Etta James yeah. to to Gladys Knight to Bob Seger um, that you always feel like you have been in that arena in terms of working with with artists but still pushing your name out there. Yeah, I, I was always behind the scenes, singing in the background and and always wanting to go forward and do my own thing. So I've managed to do both. I never did go on tour with those famous people, but I managed to sing on their records, which helped lift my career up to do what I needed to do. Um, this past four years, I released an album called Honest Woman, 
and Honest Woman was something that I had in place, uh, that had been working on for 20 years. Finally got it out, started winning all these great awards for it, and, and then pandemic hits. And I was looking forward to touring all over the world. Um, when those things happen, you get scared. You start wondering, what, wondering what's going to happen. And, and I thank God for the internet, you know, because that did start to help me when people ask me to do certain uh, performances recorded. About a month ago, we heard a recording of you and Jeff Daniels singing this song yeah. called I Am America. Yes. Um, tell me about how that song came into being and your collaboration with Jeff Daniels that everyone knows is an actor, but likes to sing a bit on, uh, perform yeah. as well. Well, I got a call and from Jeff's people and they asked me, uh, would, would I be willing to perform with him on, on a song that he's putting on his album? And I was excited. I didn't know to what capacity. I just thought I'm singing with Jeff Daniels. Yeah, and so when they sent me the music, and I noticed that it, it only had the hook and one of the verses, and I had to write the rest of it. And I said, "Okay, well, this is this is good. This is a, a stretch for me, um, but I, I'm I'm going to enjoy this." And I wanted to speak on what I'd been feeling, as far as what's been going on in the world, what's been going on in this country, what what we've experienced all of us, but what I've experienced in my life as far as being a black person in this country. And so I wrote the words, give me my freedom. Um, all I want to do is breathe. And, and all of these things that have not been happening in this country for hundreds of years. And I wanted to put it in this song. For I will rise up. When did you hear it for the first time and what was the reaction? The first time I heard it uh, for the public is when my Twitter started blowing up. <laughs> and I had no idea that they were going to use it for the ad campaign, which I'm glad they did that too. Um, but I'm like, why is my phone blowing up? And I went to it, it was like nine o'clock at night. And people were liking me and following me all of a sudden on my Twitter page. And so I went to well, the reason why, and and I'm like, whoa, whoa, this is really. <laughs> they put it on this commercial for the two senators down in Georgia. You know, it's the um, the intersection of what you said is speaking your truth, mm -hmm. activism, everything colliding in one ways, and you said even stretching yourself into into places maybe musically that you hadn't been before. I wanted to to write a song. Uh, speaking on the, the things that have been going on as far as the police brutality and, and people making peaceful protests and, and, and having the president at, at that time uh, answer with, with more violence. And I'm like, how does this work? You know, why, why can't we just be at peace? I'm just looking forward to better days happening. Um, I got a song called I Believe Everything's Gonna Be All Right. And a, a lot of... Uh, Things happened this last year that helped had me struggling with that belief. And I, I believe God gave me that song to help others keep the faith. Turning now to Michigan author Ken Quattro and his book, 20 Years in the Making. Ken is well known as a comic book historian. He was a consultant on the 2017 film, Professor Marsden and the Wonder Women. But it's his new book on the untold stories of black comic book artists that is getting a lot of national attention and shining a light on talented men who face systemic racism. Will Glover has more. So with this book, The Invisible Men, you, is set out on a journey that a took a while and and b i'm i'm 
I'm assuming you found out some things that you may or may not have been expecting. So let's start with Mr. Samuel Joyner. Um, yes. Could you tell us a little bit about who he is and how he helped you uh, get started down this road? I've been writing about uh, comics and comic books for probably going on 50 years, back to the early 70s. So I've been doing this a long time. I've written many articles and stuff. And I was going to be writing about a, a, a particular artist named Matt Baker. Any research I could find on any articles, any reference to it all only came up with two things. That Mr. Baker died young. He died when he was 37. And he was black. And at the time, 20 years ago, a lot of people considered him the only black comic book artist of all time back in the 1940s and 50s, which to me seemed really odd. You know, just right. in... Statistically, that didn't make sense to me. So for years, I was trying to track down information about Matt Baker. And I kept asking everyone. And finally, I came across somebody who just casually mentioned, hey, have you spoken with Mr. Samuel Joyner, who was a retired black cartoonist from Philadelphia? He'd done most of his work for the Philadelphia Tribune. Well, Mr. Joyner wrote me this beautiful four-page letter, detailed uh, letter, talking about meeting not only Matt uh, Baker, but he met uh, uh, E. Sims Campbell. He met uh, Ted Shearer and these different artists, Jay Jackson. And I'm going like, what? Wait a minute. I mean, who are these people? You know, it, right. like some of the names I were vaguely familiar, but nobody had I ever come across who ever actually physically met these people. Not only did he write me this letter, but he included a lot of clippings, newspaper clippings and photocopies of articles. And it was like a starting point for me on saying like, oh, okay, I'm gonna start researching some of these men. Well, well, I started, uh, the normal places where I would start my research would be in, in newspaper archives. Right. There was nothing, you know, and this is something I've been doing for years, you know, and so I knew, you know, I was, you know, I looked at my uh, regular sources, but I couldn't find anything. Well, it dawned on me, I said, well, what about black newspapers? Well, unfortunately, very few libraries carry black newspaper archives. They were wow. considered disposable. Nobody, very few places have at the time had black newspaper archives. So I started trying locating, fortunately the internet existed at that time. So I started these wide searches, libraries all over the country trying to find any library that had any black newspapers. What the white media had never covered was that these men were respected artists. Almost every single one of these guys I cover in uh, Invisible Men was respected, classically trained fine artist, or they had been uh, schooled in art and everything. Every single one. Wow. And um, which was unusual because most comic book artists of the 1930s and 40s were self-taught white guys from New York. You know, they couldn't find a job and, and they were the lowest, it was the lowest rung of uh, commercial art. Well, that, that's that's why with this book too, um, if you notice with each one of the profiles, I talk about not just the man in his career, but the entire history of a man. I sometimes I go back generations, mm -hmm. so you get an idea of where these people came from. It's right. it's not just a snapshot of, of a year or two of time. We, we have a tendency in life to uh, look at people in a microcosm, saying like, oh, they did this for you know. This is what he was. He was an artist for two or three years on comic books. Right. Like Elmer Stoner is a perfect example. Elmer Stoner was uh, an established, classically trained fine artist of the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. Established artist. He became a commercial artist. He's one of the very few blacks to break over into the white media. And he worked almost exclusively in white media. But in comic books, he was he was basically ignored. He, he, was, uh, he wasn't a real flashy artist or anything like that. And what it was is a lot of these guys didn't put a lot of effort into comic book art. It was a way to put food on the table. And that's, it's right. the truth, Will. It really was. Yeah. I mean, it was, a lot of it was hack work. Like, you know, we need a, a comic book story, you know, eight pages long. How quick can you get it to me? I'll get it to you in two days. Okay. As an artist, I can tell you that's almost impossible if you're really, right. you're putting a lot of work into it. You know, so... You're, you were not seeing, you know, the best of these men, but we have a tendency in our society to look at just the tiniest part of a person's life and not look mm. at the entirety of life. You know, right. we, we define people in, in, in the most narrow ways. 
And what I do again with this book is, is try to give a wider view of a, of a person's life. So that said, where can people go if they want to get their hands on a copy of The Invisible Men? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it's literally everywhere, but you can go on Amazon. Uh, it's sold, sold through a couple times already. I also prefer people go to their local uh, comic book shop and probably help some of these guys out because a lot of them are having a tough time right now. And it, like I say, I, I think it, it, it speaks to a lot of people, you know, because it, it shows the human experience, you know, of what so many people have experienced. And, and like I said, these men are inspirational, you know, and I don't care who you are, you should be inspired by their stories. This next story comes to us from our show on Detroit Public Television called Detroit Performs. It's about artist Sabrina Nelson and her work capturing the essence of black motherhood, loss, and transformation. I think my medicine is art. My language is art. I think the term artist means to be responsible for what's happening in the world, how you see it, how you record it, how you make things that are a result of what you are trying to say, whether it's a question you're answering or a story you're trying to tell or here's something I need to make because it's just embedded in me, like I have to make something. Detroit is embedded in who I am. I've been here all my life <laughs> since the rebellion in 1967. That's when I was born. And so everything around me becomes a part of the story I'm trying to tell or the question I'm trying to ask. My superpower is being able to visually communicate how I feel about what's happening in the world. Nina Simone says if you're going to be an artist, it's your duty to reflect what's happening in the world. And in the world that I live in, from the time I can remember remembering, there's always trauma and hurt and pain. And I'm not always talking about that, but you can't ignore it. And on this day, I think about the lives that are lost, that are constant, like coming at me through different mediums. And so I'm thinking about homicides and deaths of young people and how I'm affected by it. But I'm talking about death where people aren't considered people, like you don't matter. You, you're not important. So I'm just gonna take your life. I don't care how old you are, I don't care who you belong to. And when that person is missing from our communities, not just the blood family is affected. We are all, and we should all be concerned. You know, a life is a life, a human is a human. And so in this work, I'm talking about that pain. The name of the exhibition is Why You Wanna Fly Blackbird, and I got it from a Nina Simone song who talks about black women like, how dare you try and be happy in your life? How dare you not expect pain? Pain is gonna come. You have to move through it and you have to live, but pain will be here. I didn't want the colors to be so seductive that it draws you in as pretty. Like, I don't like the idea of my work being pretty. I want it to be impactful. I want it to be deeper than just what you see. And I wanted it to be large enough to have some girth to it. So these particular pieces are very large drawings. They're also reliquaries, if you will. So they talk about like the body, the housing of the bodies that we have, like the home, and then what it's like to have a nest with no eggs in it. Thinking about the empty nest of children who never return. You know, I don't care how old they are, they never can return. So I'm just talking about the darkness in that and expressing it with the most eloquence that I can. The cages will represent empty homes that can be the home that they lived in, that can be the community that they lived in. How do you deal with that, you know, that womb that's empty? And so when we lose these people that are not treated with value out of our communities, how do you deal with that? 
So Levon is helping me on the dresses because I want to make dresses that will hang from the ceiling just above the patron's heads, but the bird cages will be the empty rooms underneath the dresses. And so I'm asking him to help me figure out how I'm gonna make the dresses, which are made out of Japanese rice paper, so that they can be sheer enough that the bird cages can go underneath them and the patrons can see them with the lighting. And hopefully they have the impact that's in my head and in my heart. I want people to pay attention to it and to be more empathetic with others' lives. If you see something happening and you can do something about it, why wouldn't you? And so when I look at the homicide rates across the country, they're incredibly high for African-American, indigenous, and also Latin American children. And so if this is all I can say and do about it, I want someone to know that I care. Even though they're not my children, I care that they're missing, that they're gone, that there's you know, somebody should think about doing something about it. The motion of movement when I'm making these things, like when I did the nest here, you know, the motion of drawing and drawing and drawing, you know, that obsession of movement and what it feels like to do that. These movements that we do over and over become very much ritual. Maybe these are all prayers visually to say, I'm sorry that your life is gone but I want to say that you meant something, that you were important. Every artist wants someone to look at their work for a long time. And I didn't want to make it so obvious and obtruse where it's like, you know, you see people getting killed. But I think the work and the drawings and some of the paintings that I'm using can be seductive. So I want people to make sure that they walk away with knowing that I'm in a world, I am affected by it, and don't just listen to the news and be in the world and not really take part in what's happening. Think about what your voice is and what your superpower is and see what you can do to help. I wanna say something that's important and I wanna leave this world with something that someone's learned from me. My work might be sensual, it'll draw you in and then it's gonna slap you a little bit. And that's what I hope I show. And for more stories from Detroit Performs and all of the stories that we are working on each week, just head to OneDetroitPBS.org. All right, it's time for a little inspiration, a little bit of fun. I'm going to leave you with a performance. The Detroit Youth Choir singing Katy Perry's Roar. It was recorded at Mary Grove. Enjoy it, and I'll see you next week. Take care. I used to bite my tongue and hold my breath, scared to rock the boat and make a mess. So I sat quietly, agreed politely. Only that the guy that I had a choice. I let you push me past the breaking point. I stood for nothing, so I fell for everything.
You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan, dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation and viewers like you.